<laughs> so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, who's Katie Collins. She's a PhD student supervised by Adrian Weller at the University of Cambridge, and she's working on um, um, scalable, trustworthy machine learning. She's also got um, a, a bachelor's in uh, brain, cognitive science. brain cognitive sciences. Thank you. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Katie. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge working with Adrian Weller and I did my bachelor's with Josh Tenenbaum. Um, so this will be work that is uh, in collaboration with them. And we're talking about human-centric benchmarking in ways that we can look to cognitive science at, in this new age of foundation models. And thanks to Mike and everyone for, for inviting me to give this talk today. And I want to highlight that this is joint work with a huge array of collaborators spanning the Cambridges of MIT and uh, the University of Cambridge. And I want to give a particular shout out to Leo Wong, who's a PhD student with Josh Tenenbaum, who is the co-first author on the primary work that I'll talk about today. Now, what I really hope you take away from this talk is that humans are flexible and adaptable. We're incredible reasoners. We can handle new problems, new constraints, new tasks fairly readily. Um, if we want our models to be similarly flexible, robust, able to handle constraints, added distribution problems from little data, I think that it's important that our benchmarks are designed to be similarly. And I know we've heard a lot about benchmarks already, and we'll hear some more from Percy today. Um, but what I want to focus on here is kind of the synergy that I'm really excited about between cognitive science and AI in the space of foundation models. And what do I see um, coming to fruition from, from this synergy? One is in more human-centric benchmarks. When talking to uh, the cognitive scientists that I've interacted with a lot at MIT, I'm continually inspired by the creative way that cognitive scientists have come to benchmark and kind of get an understanding of how humans reason and the flexibility and capacities of human reasoning. So I think that there's a lot as AI researchers in the AI community that we can look to in cognitive scientists for how to design better benchmarks and evaluation measures. Second, I think we can still look to cognitive science for more human-inspired um, computational modeling. I'll get into that a little bit more at the end of the talk. And conversely, I also think that there's some really exciting discourse between cognitive scientists and AI researchers on how the rise in foundation models might inform a revision or at least a reconsideration of some of the existing computational cognitive theories of how the brain works. So I think that there's a lot of really exciting conversations to be had there. Additionally, an area that I'm increasingly excited about, particularly through conversation with Adrian Weller, Umang Bhatt, and Valerie Chen, is on human-machine teaming, of how we can actually use these language models and how people would use them in the world, as, as we heard from Phil a little bit earlier today. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on human-centric benchmarking. However, I'm quite interested in all three of these and would be keen to discuss um, afterwards, and I will touch on the latter two a little bit at the end. Now, the outline for this talk is that I'm first going to go into a benchmark that we designed to kind of check both human and model flexibility and reasoning. I'll go into a bit of detail on how we actually designed this benchmark, um, because I hope that that will stimulate some discussion uh, in the various breaks of how we might be able to scale this benchmark uh, and extend it to other models and other domains. I'll then include some observations that we've had so far with how models and humans perform on our tasks. Um, and then I'll, I'll conclude with some looking ahead of what I'm particularly excited about with extending the benchmark, um, new computational models that might be inspired by what we've seen so far, um, and then some prospects for human machine teaming with foundation models. Now, before going into the benchmark that we designed, I think it's important to reflect on what the research question was uh, when we were designing this benchmark in the first place. We've been continually inspired by how um, impressive these models seem to be from the massive amounts of data that they've been trained on. That people express so much of our fears, our beliefs, our stories, our desires, our plans, and our goals in language. And these rich traces of reasoning uh, have now been exposed to these foundation models when they're trained on lots of text from the web, lots of data that people have given uh, uh, on the web. So you wanted to see how much of the structure of thought and the structure of reasoning can we capture, can these models capture from language alone. Uh, so to be able to ask that question, we really needed to get a sense of how these models were at problem solving. Um, so that was one of the, the primary motives for when we were designing this. And in particular, we wanted to be able to check problem solving in open-ended yet concrete domains. And you might say that that's a bit of a, how is that possible to be open-ended yet concrete at the same time? And what I mean by this is with open-ended, we didn't want to be just looking at multiple choice um, uh, benchmarks and evaluation, which are certainly of incredible value. But we really were, were interested in studying free-form generations. So say if you have goal-based planning problems or causal explanations, how are models able, how do we compare models that have generated full free-form plans to human plans and same with explanations? 
And by concrete, I mean that we wanted that these to be evaluated by people in at least a, a, a semi-reliable um, uh, way. So it's certainly very, very interesting to study the creativity of these generations, but we are very interested in kind of how good these plans actually are. So we needed them to be fairly concrete, um, the task to be concrete. We also wanted our tasks to be challenging. Uh, we wanted to push the boundaries to see how good these LLMs are, because uh, we focused on LLMs, at reasoning compared to people. Um, and I wrote in the age of LLMs here because what makes a task challenging is increasingly hard um, to kind of measure and get a sense for with language models now because they've been trained on so many tasks on the web, particularly um, uh, challenging tasks. So how do you actually come up with a goal for one of these systems that hasn't been seen before? So say how to fix a flat tire, that's probably, uh, there's a lot of information online about how to do that. So we really wanted to design tasks in that way. We also wanted it to be leveled, so we wanted to be able to get a sense for how models actually compared against people in kind of a, a, a graded way. So those were things that we had in mind when we were designing the tasks that we did. And what we settled on was this idea of using constraints. And this is work that we published in COGSCI uh, last year and that we're extending now um, uh, for hopefully a journal paper beyond. Um, but I'm a track uh, athlete in the past, so I like to think of this in terms of hurdles. So what we designed was a leveled um, uh, benchmark where we had three different settings. One was unconstrained, so we had various tasks, and I'll give some examples of this um, momentarily. Uh, and it's still a race, so it's still, there were still some challenges there, uh, but we didn't, it wasn't as hard as when you add, say, a hurdle or many hurdles. So we used constraints to kind of add more and more challenge to the task and push out of the distribution that had ever been seen before. Um, so I'll go into a little bit detail on the, the way that we actually constructed this constrained reasoning, um, these tasks. So first what we did is we designed a diverse range of the base tasks. So Josh Tenenbaum, uh, Leo, and I uh, kind of tried to think how could we come up with a set of goal-based planning problems and causal explanation scenarios um, that kind of spanned a gamut of typicality. Um, so we came up with were 28 uh, tasks it related to explanations and 28 related to planning that meant to kind of span a, a range of what you might see or do in the world um, against uh, what you might never have had to deal with before of, say, keeping a baby platypus entertained. So we came up with these all in language. Um, and uh, uh, so for example, we had, how would you clean the dirty dishes? We would then ask people and language models this, um, to how would you create a safe landing for a falling skydiver? How would you jump over a six foot tall man? Uh, and on the explanation side, we had prompts of the form if X, then Y, so giving some kind of a causal relation, and then saying, but suppose X and not Y, um, and asking why that might happen. Um, so all the way down to if a piano is, is dropped from a skyscraper, then the piano shatters, but what if a, a piano is dropped and it doesn't shatter? Can you explain why that might have happened? So kind of trying to test the flexibility um, of reasoning across this, this spectrum of, of challengingness. Uh, so what we did is we recruited humans from Prolific, which is a crowdsourcing platform very similar to Mechanical Turk. Um, and as we've heard today, that this is quite expensive to actually do this. And the experiments that I'll go through today were over a thousand um, humans. So it's definitely very important to get funding for these kinds of human studies. Um, so what we did is we recruited humans to generate solutions to the tasks. Um, and then we took the generations that they gave us and use these to form the constraints. So to, to extract the hurdles, we kind of wanted to see what people were giving as generations for our prompts. So as an example, uh, for the task of imagining what, why a fire alarm might not have gone off in the case of a fire, each of these are different humans, um, generations, and we got 10, 10 of these per, per, uh, for each of the 28 prompts. So one person said this could have happened because the batteries are dead, another that the fire alarms had not been changed, another that there was faulty wiring. What we then did is then took ourselves kind of manually uh, uh, coded out what the latent causes in, in the planning case the nouns were and used these to form the constraints. So then we had our various leveled situations that we would then give to other humans and models of say now um, solve the following task but now you can't use the reason that the battery, that the fire alarm was dead or that the fire alarm was dead and the wiring was faulty. So we constructed tasks in that way. Um, and then we got more people, different people, to give generations. And we got quite creative and really fun generations. And a lot of these constrained um, tasks in the many constraint case had quite a lot of constraints, say up to, up to five or more. Um, so they were very, very challenging and people are still able to solve them as I'll go into. So you can see some of the generations here. So that's how we probed uh, uh, people to get these generations and we ended up getting 10 people for each of these tasks across um, both domains and across the three different constraint conditions. Um, and 
we then used GPT-3 as our base model to compare against. We started this work in 2021, so before InstructGPT had come out officially. Um, so the GPT-3 that I'll be talking about primarily today was fully distributionally trained, so no reinforcement learning with human feedback, no um, kind of instruction fine-tuning. Um, so it, the one that we were working with primarily dealt with few-shot prompting. So the way that we prompted to get generations from GPT-3 here was trying to give the model the fairest chance possible. We really wanted to see how good the model was at, at being able to kind of solve the um, constrained challenge reasoning tasks that we were giving it. So we seeded the model with several generations from people, so between 12 and 15. So we gave it human-generated plans and explanations for different tasks than the one that we were going to ask about. We then asked it about a goal or a, an explanation task, say, um, how would you escape from inside a locked closet? Uh, we then did, ran several rollouts of GPT-3, so we were able to run it with a decently high temperature to get um, lots of different generations. And before then kind of taking these generations as the ones that we'd evaluate against, we did a little bit of another um, human experiment where we had humans filter out the language that they thought was not syntactically similar to humans. So we noticed that a few of the generations, a very small proportion, would have very repetitive text of, say, I would take the door off its hinges, I would take the door off its hinges. Um, and we didn't want to bias or kind of downweight the results um, based on that because we were really trying to check reasoning capacities. Um, and while this seemed to be fixed, if you might have seen in some headlines that uh, this tendency for these models to occasionally generate repetitive um, text does still persist in, in, I think, Bing Sydney had at least one example of this. So we did run a humanist filter where we then um, removed any of these uh, with uh, participation of crowdsourced workers. Then to evaluate performance, we then brought in another set of humans to rate the subjective goodness of these plans and generations. So on seven of an extremely good plan or extremely good um, explanation for the task all the way down to, to, to very, very poor. Um, and we did only a single, single scalar uh, evaluation measure here, but we're doing work now of actually trying to measure uh, goodness on several dimensions. Um, so say the plan is accurate, the plan is plausible in the real world, maybe the plan is coherent but not um, uh, efficient. Um, but as you'll see, we have humans involved at several different stages of this pipeline. So you might be asking, how scalable is that? Uh, but I think that this is a really important uh, question to reflect on, particularly as we want to try this benchmark on several other models, um, kind of extend the task that we were doing. So again, we had humans involved at many stages, which was on the constraint generation and the constraint extraction, on the process of actually coming up with the base task in the first place, that's what we did, um, on the generation of language, on these humanness filtering, um, and on the goodness ratings. Um, so I think it's very interesting to consider how we might be able to use automated solutions or automated techniques to kind of remove humans from different stages of this process, and then also reflect on where we do still need humans. I'd argue we still need humans to generate the language uh, that we are using to benchmark against, um, as well as right now, I think, generating the goodness ratings, that it's still I think it's very valuable to have humans rating um, whether these plans and explanations are good or not. Um, however, I think you could remove some of the syntactic filtering that we did with humans and the uh, constraint generations. I think you could get models to generate those. So before I go into the results, I again want to highlight that we are looking at an earlier version of GPT-3. This is before any instruction fine-tuning, um, uh, before any reinforcement learning with human feedback, but I think it's still valuable because this earlier version of GPT-3 might be used in practice, um, and we get really cool insights into humans. Uh, from a cognitive angle. So I'll show here that these are the uh, uh, average ratings for each of the different constraint conditions. So kind of initial is no hurdle, uh, most common constraint is one hurdle, and then many hurdles. And this is for planning and explanations. And gray is the, are the GPT-3 rated generations, and blue are the humans. And I want to remind that we, when we were having humans rate these tasks, we told them that they were rating human and uh, machine-generated text, but we didn't tell them for any given plan or explanation that they were rating, whether it was from a human or a machine. Which I think is a separate interesting question, if we could run a little Turing test with that. However, what we can see, remarkably, is that people are incredibly flexible as you add constraints. So if you look at the planning domain, you see that people barely fall off at all in their average performance. And this, again, is, is really impressive because these many constraint cases are very, very challenging. They include, how would you bake a cake without a list of several common ingredients, without an oven, without a microwave, several um, uh, different uh, uh, common techniques are ruled out. Um, and we saw similarly in explanations that there's a little bit of a fall off, which I'm happy to discuss about in the discussion period. Um, but what we notice in particular is that humans are better both within each condition, within each kind of constraint task, and across, that uh, GPT-3 fell off quite 
um, decently sharply, because this is quite over averaged, uh, as we added constraints. So you might then be asking, what is happening when the LLM GPT-3 is failing here? What do those look like? What are humans actually doing? Um, and how can we close that gap to make it better? I think it's also worth noting that people aren't perfect here, so there is still room to possibly get even better at these tasks. Um, though some of that might be from the evaluation. So what we noticed in some of these qualitative failure modes from uh, the LLM is that they seem to be related to common sense reasoning. Um, now, the common sense reasoning that I'm going to talk about here is very uh, uh, cognitively motivated. So Liz Spelke, who's a fantastic psychologist from Harvard, has this notion of kind of core knowledge that uh, humans in general share, that we have a notion of objects and agents in the ways that things move about and kind of act in, in the world, that we have a, a, a set of um, uh, knowledge primitives about how the world works, and that's, that's shared in general. And there's also the idea that we then have some kind of base sense of how to compute over this knowledge that, that we possess in our heads. Um, and I think that this is something that can sometimes be taken for granted, that we, as we're interacting with other humans, we usually assume some shared base of knowledge, some shared sense that we are humans, that there are, um, we each have beliefs in it and, and ways of going about the world. Um, and this is what we notice to be missing from the, the model, particularly on the physics side of things. So I'll go into some of the generations, and I'm picking up some of these here, but you can see if you, if you um, look at our repository, we have all the generations that we got so far, um, as well as all the humans. You, you can see that this is not entirely cherry picking, but I wanted to choose some um, uh, compelling examples. So if you see here on the create a safe landing for a falling skydiver without using a net, that the generation, if you read it pretty quickly, at first it might seem at least a little bit sensible, but if you then look closely, it's saying that you would tie a rope to the tree, tie a rope to yourself, tie rope to the skydiver, and run up to the tree when the skydiver jumps. Uh, that would likely take you out, the skydiver out, and the tree possibly take it down. Um, or I um, have a fear of fire, so I'm quite concerned about this one, where if we said kind of put out a, a fire that's near your TV uh, without using a fire extinguisher or several other um, instruments, which could happen, um, if you then asked this GPT-3 assistant what to do, it said to use the wires from the TV to short the fire out. That's very concerning, that if, if you're in an emergency situation and you are going to um, kind of jump to trust a machine and it gives you this, um, that's quite not, not what you'd want. And this, we think, is partly as you push out of distribution and you add these constraints and you make it a problem that hasn't necessarily, um, this model hasn't seen before. We found similarly in the explanation domain, so say if someone falls on the sidewalk, then they scrape their knee, why might that have happened? And we had, um, uh, this was in the many constraint conditions, we ruled out a lot of possible um, reasons that they didn't scrape their knee, and one of them that GBD3 generated was that the pants are made of paper, which does not make sense. If you had pants made of paper, you probably would be more likely to scrape your knee. We're also a bit confused on this one because it's very few pants are made of paper, to my uh, knowledge, so that seems low probability. Um, but in the case of the second one, of why, if you're pressing your gas pedal down all the way, why would the car drive slowly, that GBD3 generated that perhaps you were driving on a flat road. And if any of you have either run or biked on a flat road versus up a hill, you would probably know that going on a flat road makes it much easier to go fast. Um, so some of these seem to be not really capturing either a mix of world knowledge or the ability to properly kind of compute over this knowledge. Um, now, that was, again, with earlier uh, uh, GBD3 models. And we've also been exploring a little bit with ChatGPT, uh, very preliminarily. Um, but uh, I think it's first worth noting that we did play around with the playground a lot with OpenAI's playground in 2021. So these models probably have seen our tasks, yet still show some uh, kind of failure modes. So here, if you asked how to fix a flat tire, um, without a wrench, that one of the generations is that you should kind of use a rock or, or use a brick or your foot to push on a lug nut. Um, and I had to look up what a lug nut was, but if you look up a lug nut or if any of you are, are car mechanics, this probably would not work. It would make the situation worse. So you'd actually be pushing kind of a little uh, uh, metal device into the tire further rather than taking it out. Um, but I think it's worth noting that at first this seems kind of very sensible, or in the second case of how would you put a sofa on your roof without using several things that you might use if you were in that situation, um, that one of the generations said quite confidently is, is to slide it up um, using uh, cardboard or a tarp, which does not really, likely would not work quite well in the world. Um, but again, this text is very fluent and seems good at first, but when you look closer, um, you start to realize that there are some flaws in kind of the fundamental common sense reasoning that we might expect or that we expect people to have. And I think this is worth, um, worth considering and reflecting on. Uh, so now that's, that's kind of what we saw from the model, but I think it's worth turning the conversation on its head and also asking, well, what are people doing? So we saw quite flexible and impressive reasoning. Um, so in this case of how would you turn, how, uh, 
why would a light turn on uh, even though it's not plugged in and you can't use the reason that it was battery powered or there was a power surge in the house that one of the um, crowdsource workers on Prolific said that this could have happened because um, kind of you put it in citric acid and it pr produced electricity. Or in the case of why a meteor might have um, hit the ground and not formed a crater, that one of the generations was uh, kind of this really fun story that perhaps uh, it landed in a desert, so kind of thinking about the, the surface of the ground, um, and maybe the winds then were able to overtake it and kind of fill back in any crater that might have formed. Or one of my favorites, when we asked someone uh, what to do, how to build a fort underwater without using scuba gear or kind of an air tank, um, they then exclaimed, how are any of these goals possible? And they proceeded to then uh, give some qualifications and kind of challenge the assumptions and then at least start to give a reasonable plan to do this. But I think this point about saying, how are any of these goals possible? And at least kind of rec recognizing and exclaiming your um, lack of confidence and your uncertainty in how to actually solve these problems as they're really challenging is something that I would hope that an LLM assistant might be able to, to do or at least be aware of. And I'm excited for Yarin's talk later today about kind of uncertainty in these LLMs. Now, I think it's a really interesting question, um, kind of not just qualitatively of what humans are doing, but what are they doing computationally? There's still an unanswered question in cognitive science of what people are actually doing when they're solving these problems. So I won't dig into this too much here, um, but this is work that has really been spearheaded by Leo in particular, Leo Wang and, and Josh Tenenbaum, of thinking about uh, mapping from language to the space of programs. So I'm happy to discuss this, this offline, but there's this uh, increasingly exciting direction of kind of using say, language models and foundation models to take text, map into code, which we now have even better models to be able to do, and then use kind of the tools that we have for, for uh, uh, probabilistic inference in the space of, say, these probabilistic programs. We might imagine that people have in their heads kind of structured world models over um, kind of the, the properties of, say, a meteor or the ground that then we can reason in and compute over. Um, what's nice about this is that it could be more interpretable, more data efficient, um, but I think that there's a lot of really exciting questions to be had, um, and certainly kind of an alternative possible direction for, for the models today. Uh, but I can get into that a bit more later. But to move towards wrapping up, um, what I'm really excited about beyond these benchmarks and beyond these computational models is then thinking about how humans will actually use these systems. So I think that's another area that um, there's a really exciting and, and ripe synergy between cognitive science and AI of actually studying how people will work together with these systems, how we can better probe LLM limitations or foundation model limitations when we're designing assistance that we might deploy in the, in the world, as, as Phil mentioned. Um, and I think this is especially important when we have many humans that are interacting with the system, as we've seen week by week or day by day, that there's, there's new challenges that are posed when these systems are faced with kind of unexpected user behavior. So I think it's important to study how systems can handle constraints or kind of moving beyond the distribution that they've trained up beforehand. Um, or even uh, probably quite soon that we'll have many more models interacting with many humans in quite complex processes. And we really, I think, need to be sure that these models have kind of some kind of shared base of understanding that we can trust that there's some notion of common sense reasoning in these systems, or at least if there's not, that we have a good sense of kind of what the parameters are and uh, where models are failing. And in particular, I'm very excited about having systems which can take in human uncertainty and can also express their own uncertainty. And this is something that I'm very, very excited about and would be keen to discuss further. Um, so where next? I think it's really exciting to consider ways to extend our benchmark. Um, as I mentioned, that I think now, um, as we were playing in the playground in, in 2021 with this and now have published in 2022, our base tasks are now probably being trained on. Uh, but what I think is really exciting about the way that we structured this um, is that we can add constraints to move continually, kind of, we can instantly pose a new task by just adding a constraint or adding many constraints. And similarly, we can revisit our base tasks and kind of think about what problems can humans solve, what are kind of fun, fantastical tasks or safety uh, relevant tasks, and include those in the benchmark and extend them. Um, uh, and additionally, I think it's very interesting to then consider these computational cognitive inspired models of how to actually get flexible systems that can handle constraints, that can handle added distribution problems, and are aware of and can express uncertainty. So again, I want to close with uh, uh, thanking a huge array of collaborators um, who were on that particular project and then have also influenced my thinking in, um, in across both Cambridges that I've been grateful to be a part of um, in the communities. And thank you to, to uh, Mike and everyone for organizing this great event as well. And what I want to very lastly close on is this idea that I'm very excited about of adding constraints um, to be able to push out of distribution and continually evolve our benchmarks. I think that that's a great way and it's, uh, it'd be awesome to discuss ways that we can make this more scalable, particularly as our first version had many humans in the loop at different phases. So, thank you.
We should, we used workers, or we, we recruited workers on Prolific and had them all from the US English speaking um, to make sure that they understood our task, but I think that's a really, really important point, so thank you for raising it. Um, that it's not clear if this would generalize to people from other countries or other backgrounds, um, or how it would handle, say, not people who are on prolific, which might be a particular subset of all the humans in, in the world. Um, so I think it's interesting, and I'd be excited to extend this benchmark to other cultures and other backgrounds of kind of what counts as common sense, what counts as typical. When we were um, forming the constraints, we then took the most typical over the 10 humans, but kind of that, that could change depending on the, where you are. Thank you. I think it's very, very important that we have these models trained on many different languages and in many different backgrounds. And I know, um, I think I saw Sam here, but um, I, I'm really excited by the Bloom model and the work that Hugging Face is doing on training these systems on many different languages. Um, I think what's nice about something like Prolific is that you can actually kind of select which first languages you would hope that your crowdsource workers would, would speak. So you can, um, we had the, the first language be English, but you could have done it for other languages. Um, and I hope that there's other sites as well that kind of extend prolific to be able to make it easier to work with crowdsource workers kind of across the globe. Uh, but I think that's a very, very important question um, that needs more interest and in, in, in engagement. First, I think the easiest to address would be the constraint generation. I think you could then have a model um, just generate lots of different solutions, and you could then take the most common, which might not capture all of the usual generations, but one thing we wanted to rule out were just kind of common objects. So I think that's something that you could readily do um, for any kind of base task. I imagine you could also use these models to generate the base tasks. That might be risky because they might then be um, good at that task already. I think for the syntactic filtering, you could probably fairly straightforwardly have a model that can just detect if there's very, very repetitive language. I'm sure that that has been developed. I think the trickier bits are the kind of goodness score ratings that we did. Um, one thing that we're looking at now is having, as I mentioned, people uh, rating these plans and explanations on many dimensions. Uh, one thing we hope to do there is you could then train a model that can then um, kind of classify on each of those dimensions. Uh, so I think that that's an area that you probably still would need at least some base of human ratings, possibly a big base of human ratings, uh, but then you could train models that can kind of be able to do that uh, rating process itself. Um, but I think you would still need humans in the loop in different ways, especially because as, as I uh, showed, some of these failure modes are quite subtle um, that you really only reflect on and kind of notice the failures when you read it really closely. And I don't know yet um, how systems would be able to do that. I think one other approach is if you were able to map some of these into a space where you could kind of simulate uh, what might actually happen, say if you had a very, very powerful physics simulator of say the, like uh, create a safe landing for a falling skydiver, you might be able to check that there's a, a failure, um, kind of like the formalization work, I know Albert's in the audience here, that, that um, uh, folks can do in mathematics of ways to actually check whether systems are, are correct or not. We, we didn't tell them if it was an a AI system or a human generating the ratings. We did have at least three people give each of the ratings, and then we took the average, and we noticed decent agreement levels between the three different humans. Um, but you're right that that's a very important question that I continually remind myself of when working with human raters, that you could get noise. Um, there's certainly levels of disagreement, but it's an interesting question of whether that disagreement is true disagreement of different differences of belief or just that someone was trying to move really quickly through the, through the task. Um, so we're actively looking at that. I think we should stop questions here. Let's thank our speaker once again for her really thank exciting you. work. Thank you. Uh, so, so our next speaker is Mirella Lapata. She's professor of natural language processing at the School of Informatics at the University. Of, yes, you can be at the University of Edinburgh, and she's uh, she's done really great work, very important papers and semantics and generation, multiple awards and fellowships, and she currently has a. Turing AI Fellowship. Thank so you. Over to you, Mirella. Thank you. Uh, is this on? Uh, clap, clap. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is going to be a bit different. Uh, so uh, the title is Hierarchical 3D Adapters, not important, I'll explain, for long video to text summarization. Now that's important. Uh, video to text summarization. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit before your lunch 
is how you can get these big language models that are trained on different modalities, so video on the one hand and text, and marry them together. So, so far you've only heard about text and language, and uh, people give the impression that NLP is solved. I just want to put it out there. It's by no means solved, okay? There is gazillions of problems. And I'm going to show you why summarization is not solved, but also how these language models and these big models have um, opened up new areas of research that I didn't think were possible five years ago. Okay, so yeah, that's me. Um, I should point out that this is mostly work that my PhD student, Nelly Pabalambidi, has done at the University of Edinburgh. She's no longer there, she's at DeepMind, and it was all inspired when she did an internship with Markus Rohrbach, who at the time was at Meta AI. Now I think he's on his way to become a professor in Germany. Okay, so how many of you know the uh, sitcom Friends? Yes, apparently, I mean, I, younger audiences wouldn't know Friends, but apparently now 16-year-olds start watching again. It, it, has, it has made a comeback. Anyway, okay, so if I asked some of you, and many of you have watched uh, Friends, what happens in the last episode of Friends? Can we hear from the audience, somebody who actually knows what happens? How, what would you say? Separated, that's what you can say. Separated. Okay, yes? How many details do you want? Ah, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, exactly. So are we going to give a lot of details or let's say three or four sentences? Oh, this is a perfect. Perfect. Give, give them an excellent. Okay. Uh, my friend's summary was much better than mine. Um, okay. Ross confesses his love for Rachel. Um, they decide to resume their relationship. They have an on and off relationship throughout, like many seasons. Um, while Monica and Chandler, you see them there if you don't know them, adopt twins and move to the suburbs. The human summary had more detail. Okay, so we all more or less know friends. Um, this is a soap opera called Port Charles. I do not expect any of you to know this. It was cancelled after I think one or two seasons and it is very, very bizarre. There is vampires in there, even though it is taking place in a hospital. I mean, there's medics and there is a vampire. Anyway, so um, the question about how long you want the summary to be was very good. This is a relatively longer summary of an episode, and I'm gonna read out, I'm not gonna read it all, but a bit to see the level of detail, and it sounds like it's Klingon, honestly. Kevin is freed by Karen, who drops by the lighthouse, Rafe and Lucy try to persuade Ian to save himself by killing Joshua, but he refuses to even consider it. Who are these people? What are they doing? Alison provokes Reese into chasing her into the healing pool, doctors. Um, um, and Casey lures Kaz there on the pretense of do, going to the party. Blah, 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 blah. This is a summary written by a human about this episode. Blue shows all the characters in this episode. Uh, difficult. Uh, we want the machine to do that. So we want the machine to actually take us input the episode with all the video and the audio and the stuff that people say and produce a similar summary. And you may think it's impossible, but we can begin to glimpse the possible here and I, I will try to convince you how we do that. Um, now, if you're thinking that this is like a nonsense task, it's not nonsense and it's a, a form of dialogue summarization and it happens all the time in the real world and this is an actual example. What happened at the meeting last week? Humans can do it all the time. We summarize. This is a very sort of, uh, it's almost as innate to us as language. So this is a summary that a friend of mine produced. Jonathan welcomed the new members of staff. They all seemed a bit shy, okay? After a round of introductions, we discussed how to attract people back to the office. A lot of silly ideas were put forward, such as paying for bus tickets and offering breakfast every other day. Apparently some companies do that to get the people 
there. Um, Caroline and Rob engaged in a heated argument. She was in favor of punitive measures, incentives, whereas Rob preferred to organize fun activities. And this is what actually happened. Peter tried to calm things down. He was caught in the crossfire. The meeting was interrupted by a fire drill. The discussion continued on the pavement where Angela slipped and hurt her back. A lot of action there. This is a perfect summary of what happened. OK, now, why is the task hard? Very long input. Uh, GPT-3, any variant, star GPT, cannot do this at this point. You cannot give the long input. We have approximately 100 minutes of a video, OK, if we have a long soap opera, and 23,000 words. It doesn't fit, no matter how you want to look at it, it's difficult. Um, the semantics is complex. You see, if you have the background knowledge about Rachel and Chandler and whatnot, we understand what's happening, and the summary was perfect. If we are going to this point Charles thing, uh, poor Charles, we know nothing. Who is Karen? Who are the vampires? Incomprehensible. So there is a lot of uh, long-range dependencies and things happening that we have to figure out. Well, the model has to figure out. Um, it's a multimodal problem, so you're not going to get a language model that is trained on video and audio and text all together and it produces these lovely things that you want. So you actually have to do some modeling and uh, understand how these models work to modify them to do your task. And data is a problem. And data is not the problem like, you know, we have one billion, we would like three billion. Data is a problem because how many videos are out there that you can collect and summaries. It's not going to be in hundreds of millions. It's going to be more like thousands. So we have to come up with clever models to actually do our task with little data. OK, and evaluation is going to be a problem. And uh, people talk about evaluation here. We saw in the morning in the context of how do you benchmark these large language models. But evaluation is a problem because these models are out there, they generate stuff, and we don't know, are they good? Is it a good summary? Is it a bad summary? Um, can I check it somehow? How do we have automatic metrics that do the task? Do the metrics work even? They were developed for other types of models. So, uh, big problem. Okay, so you may think, and I, honestly, I did not know that Mike was going to say that summarization is a task that these models can do very well. Uh, this is a, a graph that plots all the how publications on summarization um, have multiplied over the years. Um, it starts at 2000 till 2022, and these are most NLP conferences. I mean, there's some leakage because people publish at NeurIPS and whatnot, but let's see uh, this graph. Now, uh, you see this, there's a standard trajectory, highly non-sexy area for a while, and then suddenly from 2018 and onwards, there is this exponential growth. And of course, conferences have gotten bigger, but there, is, there aren't that much bigger between 2018 and 2022. So there's a lot of research, and people have the idea that, you know, the, the problem is kind of manageable. Let's see what's out there with regards to summarization and the tasks. There is text to test, text. This is what everybody knows, which is you have the text in and you get a summary out and they're on the same modality. And there's a list of data sets here that um, people have created and um, they've worked on. And in particular, um, uh, the last one, some screen is something we will be developing on. It's a dialogue summarization data set of TV uh, series. OK, so people also have worked on video to video. So the video is in, video is out. You sort of chop it up somehow when you create a video summary. And there is very little work on video to text. And what I'm talking about is this video to text area, where there is two data sets that I could find. One is TACOS, which is um, only video as input. You don't get the language and very few samples, so you can't even train. You can do nothing with it. It's a small, very, very small scale. And how to, which has very short input and very short output. So again, it doesn't fit our um, problem formulation. Um, and we will take this some screen data set that others have developed and make it multimodal to be able to do our task. I'll show you how. Okay, so um, 
this some screen 3D will be multimodal, will be long input, it will be this TV series that are incomprehensible but real, and uh, it will be 4.5 samples, and that's all we have, not big. And this is after a lot of effort to collect, so this data is not out there just naturally. Okay, so with regards to now how we will be modeling the task, this is the war of the language models. Um, I stole this slide from Hugging Face, and I should have a credit there. So this um, is the trajectory from June uh, 2021 up to chat GPT. And these are uh, language models with b bigger than one billion parameters, OK? And you may be wondering which one of those I will be using throughout this talk. And the answer is none of them for two reasons. One is most of them are actually not accessible. They are proprietary. You can see the X's outnumber the ticks. And the other problem with these models is that they're only based on text. And we have a multimodal problem. So, and because it's multimodal, we actually have to marry the two. And we have to go and look at the weights and modify the weights. So. Um, we cannot use these very super big one billion parameter models. We will go back to the what Phil would call base models, which are still big. Don't get me wrong, they're huge, but they're not like in the billion era. OK, so this is what the hypothesis will be for this research, that by incorporating this information from the video and the audio, by making the task multimodal, um, simulating what humans do in the real world, um, we can facilitate the summarization task. So the premise is that all this multimodal information will make us create better summaries. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to marry language models that have been created for these two distinct fields. So uh, the multimodal world and the text-only world. So um, there have been uh, models that people have developed uh, that focus on audiovisual representations. For example, CLIP, and I, I have the parameters there to see that these models are not huge. Um, CLIP was trained by OpenAI and it, 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 with the um, images and text, so it can communicate in both uh, these worlds. Uh, Slowfast is a, an interesting uh, system. It actually uh, has been trained on video and can output objects in the video and also uh, the scene label, what scene we are indoors, outdoors, and what not. And Yamnet um, is about the audio, and it has been trained with 500 different classes. and can tell you whether there is crying, whether there is barking, and we will take all of this information. This is the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, there have been in NLP developed models that actually are very good summarizers based on text. Text in, summary out. And these have a very natural inductive bias. They summarize text. So we're going to take one of these models with a natural text-based summarization inductive bias, and we're going to take all these other multimodal representations, and then we'll see how we will be putting them together. OK. And we will come up with a parameter-efficient way of doing it, because data is not a lot, and you can't really um, fine-tune. If you fine-tune the entire model, again, these big models on the small data set, you just overfit and you don't learn anything. Okay, so let's first start with the data and how it looks like. So this is the original uh, some screen corpus, and you see on the left, and it's not important to read, this is the transcript, like what the actors say, and on uh, next to it you get the summary. So this is the original data set, and all we will do is we will take the transcript, the YouTube video of the same episode, so we get the video, and the summary. So we enhance this with its video. That's all. And there's some statistics here. Um, there is 4.5 thousand episodes. Um, there is one million video shots. Um, and this is the data we have in the multimodal domain. Okay. And there is uh, more than one summary per episode. 
because summer is very, again, in terms of length, and we want the model to be able to generate long as well as short summaries. Okay, so this is the data out of the way. Uh, the next problem is how are you going to put the, the two, the, all these different um, modalities together? So the audio and the video and the text to be able to do this uh, task. Um, and so I don't know how much you can see down there. I will not go a lot in the details, but I'll explain the structure of the model and what we're doing. And hopefully you're going to get the high level idea. So this is BART. This is a model in NLP that we use and love. Um, it's a sequence to sequence model and it's trained on text only. And the cool thing about this, it has been trained with a summarization objective so it can summarize. Um, the input is text. You get at the bottom here, this sequence of words um, or tokens and these tokens, it learns representations of the sequence of tokens that are in a document. The, your representations are the H's up there. And then because it's an encoder-decoder model, the learned contextualized representations are fed to the decoder that is supposed to generate the summary given the input document and the words generated so far. And you see these models are, it's a transformer and they're rather complicated in the sense that, you know, there's L layers in the encoder, L layers in the decoder, we have uh, self-attention. These blocks are repeated in every layer. In the encoder, we have the self-attention block for the contextualization to make the words aware of context. We have a feed forward. And then similar architecture with some more bells and whistles like cross-attention. We look back at the input to model relations between input and output. And then finally, we have this language modeling head that takes these representations, maps them to the vocabulary after a softmax layer. Now, this is the main text-based model, and somehow we have to cram the multimodal information into it, and it's not clear how, I mean, it will be clear, but the question is how you do it. Okay, so um, the first thing we're, I'm gonna say is that we will actually have a data efficient way. We will not fine tune the entire model, we will keep most of BERT frozen. We'll take it as it is, but we will include another block, some, another computation block and a representation block called adapter. So what the adapter does is the only trainable part in this very big model that will specialize BART for us for our task. So the only thing we will train is this adapter layer there, this adapter module, and we will see uh, how we will do this, okay? And this will be responsible for the multimodal information, for putting the multimodal information into the model. Now, one thing that I did not tell you so far is how exactly, what do we do with this multimodal information? Because I have video. What, what do I do with the video? I have to have the video and I have to put it into some model that actually expects tokens. So am I gonna turn the video into tokens? How is this gonna work? Not so clear. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we will assume that the multimodal information, audiovisual information, is an utterance. Think of it as a sentence. It's not a single token. And what we will further assume is that even though the, the input is this document that has this sequence of tokens, every now and then it will have a big token that will cry out and say, I am multimodal information. I am an utterance. So, and I, it's shown here, and I, I don't, can I? I don't know that I can actually, I can. Okay, so very good. So uh, these X's are the tokens. These M's are global multimodal tokens that uh, capture utterance-based information. So every now and then they get inserted and incorporated in this input and the adapter is gonna learn it and train a representation given them. And there's a lot of computation that I'm not talking about how you actually process the video and how you get the features and you know what frames you have. I'm happy to answer questions, but it's not important for the purposes of this talk. Okay, one problem is if you do this business, the model is actually trained to summarize text and now you cram into it this multimodal information, and what is the easiest thing for the model to do? 
Ignore it. Ignore it. What is this stuff inserted in me? What adapters are you talking about? I'm not just going to ignore it. So we have to actually force it to pay attention. And the way we do this is you have to introduce another loss. You are masking the input in the encoder. And by masking, you know, introduce noise. And you force it to recreate this information by taking the multimodal features into account. And you train the model for a few steps in the beginning to make it aware of this multi multimodal information because its own bias is to ignore it. OK, one more thing, and then I will talk a bit about results. Um, I mentioned that we specialize BART by including these adapter layers that are only trained. And this is very data efficient. It's like a small fraction of the parameters, I think only 3%. However, because we want the model to take into account the multimodal information, we have to do one more thing, which is change this adapter so that it's not the vanilla adapter, but enforce it to look at the multimodal information and the interactions between multimodal features. And that's what it says here, hierarchical 3D adapter. And I know this is complicated. I'll just give you the intuition. Because we have this multimodal utterance-based embeddings, we want to know how they relate to each other. Because when we generate the summary, we want to look at the important information from the input. So we compute a similarity matrix between all this multimodal information. And this is called contextualization, or a hierarchical adapter. So we contextualize this. And this is fed into the encoder adapter to be able to have more information about specifically multimodal features. And you will see in experiments this helps. Um, and this is all vanilla things. You down project the embeddings, and then you contextualize, and then you up project, and then it's a normal BART model. OK. Um, one more thing. So remember how I said that the input is very long. What do we do with this long input? This input does not fit anywhere. Um, it says it's approximately 115 minute videos. That is very long, and the encoder limit that BART has is one-fifth of that. So what do you do? You cannot fit it in BART. You cannot fit it in any of these. I mean, they're not catered for this. So you have to have a solution for actually dealing with this very long input. So there's some things you can do. Randomly chop off some of the input. Just remove it randomly. So you just keep one-fifth of your input. Um, you can have a retrieval-based solution, uh, this BM25 people use, where you look at the entire input. In our case, it will be um, the soap opera. And you see which utterances are most important. You score them. And, and importance here means how are they least similar to the rest of the um, input. Um, so you just take a percentage of these. You can have um, a supervised system that is trained on pseudo labels. So you match the input to the gold summary. Um, approximately, you have the zero one labels and you train a supervised classifier. Or you can do something else called turning point identification. How many here know anything about turning points? OK, so turning points are super cool. And if you talk to screenwriters in Hollywood, and of course we can do this because we have soap operas, uh, screenwriters in Hollywood actually swear by them. They, when you write a screenplay, um, the first thing to do is to abide by these five turning points that are ways of making the action go forward. So you have an opportunity, and then you have a change of plans. And you see there is, this is a pyramid. You're going, action escalates. Then there is a point of no return. The hero has committed to whatever they're going to do. Then there is a major setback. Things don't work out. The climax and the end. Theory has it that any good story has to have these turning points. I mean, Hollywood, the Hollywood theory. I mean, once I was giving a talk about turning points, and they asked me, 
what about Bollywood? And I go like, I know nothing about Bollywood. Maybe, perhaps, to the extent that storytelling is part of, of our genes, maybe Bollywood. Anyway, so we have um, this turning point identification uh, model that takes as input the soap opera and identifies the turning points. And so the idea is you just select as your input to your summarization models uh, part uh, things that are around these turning points. And I'll show you an example. If we have the screenplay, we have the video, we have the audio, then the turning points can be thought of as boundaries. You segment the input. And then if you take um, things around, if you take frames around this turning point, then that's your content selection. Okay, not long to go. And I will stop, I will take some questions. Okay, so how do we evaluate this model? The community uses Rouge. Rouge stands for Recall Oriented Understudy. And then I don't remember. And I actually teach Rouge in class. OK, but, but it's a recall-based metric. That's all you need to know. And the way it works, it's an automatic metric. You have the gold summary. You have the system summary it does word overlap. And it can be unigram overlap, bigram overlap, whatever. And as you can expect, it's not that great. I mean, overlap is one measure. And in particular, it's not that great now that the systems have become very good and very fluent. It was developed for systems that were not fluent. And so it cannot discriminate very well. Nevertheless, everybody uses it, and you cannot publish a paper without it. Uh, so there you go. So we have two systems that are based on text, and they, are, they have been developed for dialogue summarization, and we have fully fine-tuned them. This is like the most expensive solution, but there is no multimodal information. LED and dialogue LED, you don't need to remember the names, just remember that they're memory-heavy alternatives, and they purportedly are very good at modeling long sequences. They have specialized attention modules, sparse attention and whatnot, that take into account long inputs. Then we have BART, the model that forms the base of our own, um, with content selection. So we've selected because we can't fit everything. And you see, this is also fine-tuned, but because it doesn't, it doesn't do as well as these special purpose models. Then we have a text-based BART with adapter tuning. You get a bit of a bump. And remember, we want to do multimodal summarization. So if you have adapters with multimodal summarization, you get another bump. So this is great. This is great because for several reasons. First of all, because multimodal information helps. Secondly, because adapters are more memory efficient and parameter lean. Uh, and thirdly, because you know, doing this content selection actually uh, gives you a decent model. OK. Um, one last word about evaluation, and then I'll stop. Uh, here is the trajectory of the talk, and I have not actually done anything, and I meant to say this, about complex semantics. So we hope that these models that have multimodal information and textual information will learn the complex semantics of the domain on their own. And we, in particular, what the results show is that the multimodal information complements the textual information because there is expressions, there is sounds, there is things happening that are not in the text. Okay, now I told you that Rouge is very bad. And another thing that has happened, and I think people don't mention it that much, but it's very important. Um, because there is all these models available out there, and they are to a good standard, they work. We can actually use these models to do evaluation in ways that was not possible before. And this is particularly the case in NLP. So this is the alternative to Rouge, which is measuring things according to question answering. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a gold summary. This is the gold summary. And use a system, which we will just take from hugging face, to identify entities in the summary. By entities, we mean who is doing what to whom. Here we have the ring, Livy, 
Lucy, Karen, Frank. This is the vampires again. Uh, poor, poor, poor Charles, the vampires in the real world and doctors and whatnot. So we identify these characters, these entities, and then we're going to give them to a system, again from Hugging Face, and we'll generate questions, such as, who does Karen realize is a vampire? Frank. Who pleads with Victor to fight Joshua? Lucy. These questions are going to be gold questions. So this is a measure of what's going on in the summary. We're going to take these questions and their answers and consider them gold standard. And then we're going to take the output summaries from our system and we're going to try to answer these questions given the output. And some questions are going to be right and some questions are going to be wrong. So in this case, the system answered well um, four out of seven questions. And this is a metric of system performance that is slightly more informative than just rouge. It tells you how much does this model know about the characters. Okay, I'm skipping this and I'll go to conclusions and then if uh, we are allowed, I can take questions. So, um, I talked about this some screen 3D, which is uh, this data set, which is not very new, but it is different um, than the text only version. Um, it has text and summaries, and please use it if you feel inclined to do so. Um, important parameter efficient models to handle tasks where you may not have a lot of data. And I think uh, Phil is right. He mentioned this, that the tendency with instruction tuning and whatnot, we are entering a new era where the models are smaller but better trained or more cleverly trained. Uh, Multimodal information, and this is the exciting bit, is crucial for this summarization task. And uh, you need to do some form of content selection. Um, and I'll stop here. Is there time for questions? Uh, maybe one quick one question. One question, if there is anything. But if not, they can go to lunch. Yeah, there is a question there. Thank you. Um, so what comes after this? Is it uh, the next challenge? Is it like allegory detection, motif detection, abstraction? So yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, yes. Um, so by f the summaries are not perfect, right? They are difficult. And even a human, I didn't show human evaluation. It's not clear how a human can evaluate these things because they need to know whatever. Now, uh, there is several exciting directions. So in the movie space, yes, you can start doing, um, for example, not turning points, but uh, twists. Identify the twists or the tropes. There are these Hollywood tropes, the ingenue, the meet cute, all of that stuff you can start doing. I think what's more exciting is actually thinking ahead how you can have a model that functions in this space, so in the video, in the audio, in the language space. We don't have these models. I hear these rumors that, you know, people are developing them and whatnot. It's challenging because you always will have this data imbalance problem. And also evaluation, I'm not kidding. We need to sort this out. It's not, the field cannot progress. Um, okay. Fantastic. Uh, this we'll was stop. a, yes, I think we should stop. You will stop, yeah. Yeah, it's one. Uh, well, let's thank uh, Mirella again for her wonderful talk.